This week on the It's a Monkey podcast. There was a growing market of people who were looking for a middle class phone. I don't want a $50 phone. I don't want a $1,000 phone. I want this this phone that can do everything I need it to do, but not cost me an arm and a leg. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Good morning, hello, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Kevin Garber. I'm coming to you from downtown Sydney, Australia, looking out um, on our wonderful city across from Atlassian, who some of you know, uh, that company, one of the tech successes to come out of Sydney. I'm looking out over their offices in downtown Sydney. It's a beautiful official spring day, 1st of September, well, when we're recording this podcast. Probably you're listening to this a little bit later, but in our part of the world, it's spring. It's also the month of my birthday, so uh, new beginnings, which is always a, a nice feeling. It's a nice thing to, to feel the seasons, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. We are here on episode 104 of It's a Monkey podcast, where we talk about everything relating to technology, entrepreneurship, startups, and you can always email us at podcast at itsamonkey.com. Um, we love tips for people to interview um, if you want to be interviewed, and uh, we love to hear from you in general. As usual, I have my co-host with me, who is Kate Frappel. She is the design lead at Manage Flutter and soon to be Manage Social as well, and she's coming to us live from Whistler in Canada. Kate, how are you doing? Good, thank you. I've had a pretty busy week, but feeling pretty good. Cool. And um, coming up later on in the show, Kate did a fantastic interview with the co-founders of a um, crowdfunded phone called Frank is a Phone. And Ka Kate speaks with Mo Omer and Fahd Al-Hatab. Al and uh, they're, they're the co-founders of the uh, Frank is a Phone. And um, it's a really fascinating interview, particularly if you a young entrepreneur, because here are two very young entrepreneurs, 17 and 24, and they are taking on the Apples and the HTCs and the Samsungs of the world with a phone, a fully featured phone for less than $200, um, 200 US dollars, which is an incredible challenge. And uh, Kate chats to them later on in the show um, about their journey. And it's, it's really interesting. So stick around for that. Um, as usual, Kate, lots happening in the news, um, the tech news, uh, WhatsApp, um, intelligently Facebook, who are the owners of WhatsApp, are coming up with some special features and accounts for corporates so that corporates can uh, manage their WhatsApp from the web, so that corporates can have a corporate WhatsApp account. And uh, this is potentially, I suppose, an area which they can uh, monetize. They still haven't monetized WhatsApp at all, so they're sitting on rivers of gold. But they've announced that they're going to be uh, having some of these corporate changes come through soon. Yeah, so they're... Um there's sort of a lot of hints at the moment, like in the tech media and news about what WhatsApp's going to do to monetize itself. But at this stage, it looks like they're going to be adding uh, like a green checkbox next to certain accounts that have verified businesses. So at the moment, it's sort of a pilot program, so only a couple of people are doing it. Um, but eventually, they want to, I guess, treat it similar to Facebook Messenger where you have like a verified account um, and that business can chat to their customers through a messaging platform, I guess. My prediction is that um, a lot of these messaging platforms are going to merge, you know, with the most likelihood of Facebook Messenger merging with WhatsApp and, you know, almost going back to an email equivalent. You know, one of the reasons that email was so successful is that it was everything was happening. It was one place for everything to happen. And now we've got... Twitter direct messages and Instagram messages and WhatsApp and Snapchat. And it's, it's, it's to be across all these inboxes and you still got email and you still got your Slack message box. And it's just, it's just too much, right? And it doesn't really add value. Like to have so many different messaging platforms, you don't really get more out of life or do things more efficiently. In fact, I feel it actually has the opposite effect. Yeah, I tend to agree and like I sort of feel this way about a couple of a couple of platforms because when you think about it like Facebook own Instagram, they own WhatsApp, they obviously own Messenger and they all kind of overlap. Like you can send a private message in Instagram, you can send a private message in Messenger and you can send a private message in WhatsApp. So I think 
they're going to be smart if they can somehow merge them all into a business, um, I guess like an ad manager, which I, th- I think they're doing that now. Like Facebook and Instagram pulls in your all your comments and engagement into one place. If they can do that smart, then it'll be successful. Otherwise, yeah, exactly like you said, it's too distracting. There's too many places to keep up with. And I mean, what WhatsApp's doing, creating the corporate accounts, I think is great because a lot of these platforms, corporates discover them and they start using them. I mean, in certain countries, I believe there's whole businesses built on WhatsApp in terms of, you know, they create these WhatsApp groups and they and they sell things on them and they add people to the group and there's, there's whole new ecosystems built on it. Now, I love Twitter, right? And I've always been arguing that Twitter should have a corporate account option. Right. And it doesn't. There's just standard accounts. And I still love Twitter. It's still my favorite platform by far. I still use it the most. But businesses should be able to identify themselves in a different way and have a different tool set as well. And this is what Facebook has realized with WhatsApp. You know, the fact that you have a business using the same account as a, um, an individual doesn't really make sense. Their use cases are really quite different and you want to really make it easy for those corporates to differentiate themselves and to be able to, you know, optimize the experience with the users. So I'm not quite sure why Twitter has taken so long to create a corporate account, for instance, that could create events, right? People tweet out about events the whole time. So have a corporate account and create events and event schedule within that corporate account. But Anyway, they may have their reasons. Twitter's definitely been the, the platform that's, that's, for the most part, has iterated slower. But, yeah, I, I'm a big WhatsApp user. I like it a lot. I, I like the, the voice clip feature on WhatsApp. It's really good. I find the Facebook voice clip feature isn't actually as good. Uh, one is it's time limited. I'm not quite sure if it's 30 seconds, um, which is a little bit frustrating. It's also got a weird UI quirk where on the Facebook voice uh, recording feature where if you're recording and you're holding down the mic button to send the message, you release it. But if you pull it up, you cancel it. And sometimes as you release it, you touch it up a little bit as well. And that voice message just disappears as well. So I actually think that's a, a, a UX quirk because that's, that's happened to me quite a bit. Um, in using, I've noticed a lot of, a few of my friends are starting to use the voice on Facebook and preferring the voice quite a bit more. I actually tweeted out the founder of Slack, Stuart Butterworth, and actually said to him, Hey, we need that sort of voice clip feature in Slack, right? Sometimes you're on the go, you want to send a team member a message. You don't necessarily want to type. You just, you got your headphones on, you can just pop in a message and say, how did X, Y, Z go? I'm hoping they'll put that voice clip feature in Slack. It's, it would be really good. Mm, I feel like it's only a matter of time. Like a lot of people are doing it, but it's interesting though. Like, I, like it doesn't come naturally me to me to send a voice message like that. Like, do you do you use it a lot just to chit chat, or is it just to get a message out quickly, like an emergency or something? No, it's mainly for chatting. It's mainly um, you know sometimes some certain circumstances it's easier to chat perhaps if I'm walking and uh, you know it's time where I can actually connect with friends and to sit and staring at my phone is like I'm almost losing the effect of the walk but if I'm going on a walk in the park and I sort of just hold down the mic and I can walk and I can just chat almost like I'm on the phone with them but it's got that asynchronous nature so it's almost like the phone but it's asynchronous so that you know they don't have to be there but then 10 minutes later I get a message from them and I'll send another one back so mainly social but I can um, definitely see the application um, for work being very effective as well so it's just at times when voice is easier than sitting and typing and staring at your phone you also just have typing fatigue we type so much these days on the phone on the laptop etc so the voice clips it's a it's a trend that I'm I'm quite liking. I know people have tried to create social media platforms over the years around voice clips, like a Twitter for voice clips, et cetera. I'm not quite sure it's, you know, I suppose there was even Vine, which was, you know, not voice, but, but um, a clip, an image clip that would uh, rotate itself. I'm not quite sure there's enough in there to create an entire social platform around it, but I'd be interested to see if Twitter's going to uh, put the voice clip in. They should, actually. It would be pretty cool for you to be able to send a 10-second tweet about some 
something, you know. So the voice clip trend is, is definitely here to stay. So anyway, that's WhatsApp. Um, other story which is really interesting is on August the 30th, Apple unveiled its forthcoming AR kit, AR being augmented reality, um, which is going to hit the, um, the Apple store or the App Store after the launch of iOS 11. Uh, which is expected to be here soon in the first half of this month. So the new um, iOS software. Now, this AR kit is going to allow developers to build augmented reality-enabled apps on the iPhone. And they've revealed some use cases. And they just uh, there's a couple that are really fascinating. And, Kate, I actually think AI is actually going to be bigger than VR. I think VR is going to go down its own sort of specialist hole and you know for training and simulations and things like that. I think it's still going to be a long way until it – penetrates the average person's life. But AR, I think, is going to be totally different. I think AR is already here. They, they show a great example where you can, I, I think it's an IKEA sample where you can sort of activate your camera and you can, you can sort of point it at the corner in your living room where you want the couch and you can see what that couch looks like in your living room. Really simple, but it's actually the type of feature that would be really useful, right? Definitely, definitely. And it's sort of, um, I watched that video as well, and you can um, physically draw out like the width, width, depth and height of where you would like this particular chair. And then you would look at that space through your phone and there's a, there's a chair there. So in reality, there's no chair there. But in that space that you just drew out, your camera shows you what it would look like to have that chair in that space um, you, but you can also walk around it and if you walk towards it, it gets bigger. If you walk further away from it, it gets smaller. So it, it sort of treats it as if it's there and in the video you see the guy using his camera and just walking around like an empty piece of space but on his screen he sees this couch. So I think it would be a little bit trippy um, because you can't physically sense it and the mobile phone screen actually even though they're quite big now it still feels small to be looking at a big object like a chair that's true that's true it actually might be more appropriate for ipads and things like that you're right it might actually that that form factor of the phone might not be quite right but i think it's going to open up a whole new world of ar apps i mean they give a lot of examples again of games which is you know similar to pokemon go and i think that's definitely going to become very popular and the filters they would snapchat were the first ones to start off with i think instagram does instagram or is it facebook which one of them or both do they have filters now as well so instagram's brought in the filters similar to snapchat so snapchat right. sort of introduced them now they're quite big on instagram as well okay so yeah i mean that's an essential an augmented reality feature but i think there's going to be a lot of day-to-day -day applications and business applications and you know even if if you look at fashion right as someone who i i find it quite difficult sometimes to buy clothes I, I don't enjoy shopping i like to go in there hard and fast and i'm not always sure if if things look okay etc be and it'd be really good and i'd love to buy more clothes online and maybe if there's some sort of ar app where that just dumps the clothes on me and i can have a look and perhaps even if there's a service where it's, it's like a, it's like a, a styling service uh, online or even some crowdsource thing and upload a few things and it, with the clothes on me in a sort of virtual space and, and they say, yep, well, try that jacket that goes with that. that you know, that's real utility for me because it saves time and it saves headspace. And I think this technology is, is really starting to make, uh, make moves to that sort of direction. Yeah, yeah. I think as well, like I, you sort of underestimate the power and I guess you just have to be quite creative with how you can use augmented reality. Um, another example I saw was a cupcake. Um, so you could, through your phone, you'd push, push a picture of a cupcake onto a plate and potentially add other ingredients to it. So you sort of design a dessert and then the app will tell you how to make it in a recipe form and what ingredients you would need. So it's sort of it's making food visual and then you actually get to create it in real life because they intelligently make the recipe for you. Yeah, interesting. So it's look I think I think it's really smart of Apple to to push on the AR side of things. Um, it's 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 an idea that people are really you know, they both AR and VR and it's it's 
people are just aching for it to to break through and uh, do something in, incredibly useful. And um, uh, um, Apple aren't the only ones doing this either. So Google just um, released their AR Core, which is also a AR kit. So it's got like three new things for developers. So motion tracking. Um, it can detect like tables, floors, rugs, walls, so you can put stuff in in real space, and also has like a a light sensor as well. So Google are doing this as well, and Facebook, I believe, are launching their own AR kit as well. So a lot of the big players are introducing these toolkits. So I feel like a lot of stuff's going to start coming out in the next like twelve to twelve to eighteen months, maybe. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree. Facebook's obviously in a unique sp uh, spot. Twitter as well, actually, because they got the social graph. So the things that you can do with people on your social graph could be quite interesting and fun as well. So, yeah, it's, it's, it makes a whole lot of sense. But we'll, we'll keep an eye on the space. Is that So is the new iPhone coming out this month? Are they tying that in with the new version of iOS? Uh, I'm not entirely sure when that comes out. But I right. believe that they're getting rid of the button and it's all just – flat screen you all just you look at it and you just think right just think and it's just, does it for you <laughs> <laughs> hopefully that's not too far away as well and then every now and then your your friends or your colleagues brainwaves will interfere with your phone and you'll be like ah oh, damn we're interfering <laughs> you've, you've, you've just you've just launched my you know you've just launched my dating app <laughs> no, um, no. yeah anyway um that's uh, Apple and its AR kits. We're going to take a short break, and after the break, we're going to come back and uh, with Kate's interview, where she chatted to the founder, founders of uh, Frank is a phone, a a new crowdfunded, fully functional smart smartphone uh, that's going to be selling for less than two hundred dollars. So uh, we'll be back after the short break. Oh, oh, oh. The It's a Monkey podcast is brought to you by Check Dog. Use CheckDog to easily review and monitor your website for spelling errors, broken links, and broken images, all with the push of one button. CheckDog can also automatically monitor your website and notify you of newly introduced spelling errors. Go to CheckDog.com forward slash podcast to receive 50% off your first month subscription. CheckDog.com, helping the world's leading websites keep their content error-free. <coughs> You're back with It's Monkey Podcast. My name is Kate Frappell and I'm the co-host together with Kevin Garber, the CEO of Manage Flitter. This week, I'm excited to be joined by Fahd Al-Hattab and Mo Omar, who are the co-finders behind Frank Technologies. Frank's an Ottawa-based tech startup uh, that's recently prototyped and launched a fast, powerful, reliable and consumer-friendly smartphone with the incredibly low price tag of $180, not $1,000, $180. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks Hi, for having thank us. You. Now, tell me, how did this project start? Uh, Where did you get your inspiration from? Uh, well, um, I originally started the project back when I was in grade 10, um, and it just comes from my personal need to buy smartphones that aren't too expensive, and that's originally why I started up in the first place, not being able to buy a phone that is good and affordable for people was absolutely ridiculous to me and that's coming from a person who couldn't afford a thousand dollar phone at the time and that's kind of where the project stemmed from in the first place and Fahad and everyone else who's in the Frank project they are very very passionate about that as well and it's kind of how we all connected. Fantastic and so did you meet through university or like where's where's the meeting place? So I, uh, I, I, I started a, when I was in university, I started an entrepreneurship incubator center for students called Hatch at Carleton University. Wow. Um, and I was very, you know, very, very happy to, to get funding for it from the university. We got funding from it from the student union and some outside, uh, outside funding too, to, to help student entrepreneurs. Um, and I was in university at the time running that program and we had a cohort of, you know, 15 different students that we were helping build the businesses. And one of my friends said, Hey, I know this young guy who's, you know, trying to work on something. He's not in university yet, but do you think you can help him? And I said, yeah, yeah, bring him to our program. Like, let's let's see what we can do. Um, and so uh, we met initially on a different project. And then when he was working on the phone, he had contacted me and said, hey, I got this smartphone idea. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, you're kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> but like, let's sit down, let's, let's do it, let's figure it out. And 
you know, uh, Mo is a natural tinkerer and natural innovator and, and, you know, creator. And so he started designing and creating and modeling what a, a, you know, a good level smartphone would be. And I said, okay, let's, let's do the market research. You know, is, is there a market for this? Are there people who want this mid-class phone at a low price with high specs and, and can we actually make it? And so that took us on this, you know, over a, a year and a half long journey now of trying to bring um, a phone to market that is consumer first and customer first. So how long, how long would you say this sort of research took and, and what sort of research are we talking? Yeah, so I'd say the research took four months of, of, of really good, you know, both primary and secondary research. So it started off with secondary research, looking at market trends, market sizes, market growths. And there was a few 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 key things that, that came to our attention. One was that the largest growing segment of phones that uh, are being bought is what's considered a middle class phone. So you have your high flagship phones that are, you know, your thousand dollar iPhone 7 pluses. Um, and then you have your extremely low, low budget phones, your Nokia, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? Um, and there was a growing market of people who were looking for a middle class phone. I don't want a $50 phone. I don't want a $1,000 phone. I want this this phone that can do everything I need it to do, but not cost me an arm and a leg. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. The second thing that we saw in our research was the case study of the laptop computer market. If you go and purchase a laptop today, you're not buying the highest end laptop, you know, the $4,000 laptop, the flagship laptop. No, you're buying a laptop that's good enough for you. And that what happens there is when market saturates, when the technology becomes so good that the next next phase, of te- the next uh, edition of the system isn't marginally that much greater. And, you know, you can create a strong high-tech product at a low cost. And so looking at some of that market research, we took to, to some primary research and we surveyed uh, over five, six hundred people to see if their wi- their willingness to purchase a phone unlocked, their willingness to purchase a phone off contract, their willingness to purchase a phone that's um, not Apple. That's not <laughs> Apple. That's not Apple or Samsung, right? Exactly. You know? <laughs> we got some really positive results in that uh, that there was uh, a, you know a segment of the population. We're not talking about you know the vast majority. A segment of the population that were price conscious that wanted good technology but were not did not want to pay you know a thousand dollars um and we're not interested in signing two three-year contracts with uh, these carriers um and so we thought you know this is the perfect customer segment for us and can we now create a product that fits uh, and solves their problem yeah i think about like when i bought my so i'm on an uh, iphone 6s at the moment and uh, yeah, I mean, the difference between, especially in Australia as well, the going onto a contract and buying it outright. I mean, I understand some people don't have the money to buy it outright, but mm-hmm. um, if you can, it actually ends up being cheaper a lot of the time. It's just what I did. I ended up saving up and I just bought it outright and got onto a cheaper plan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, so Frank's essentially a phone that people can buy um, at a decent price and then they can go on to any phone plan at all. So it's like, what sort of carriers are we looking at? Um, in the U.S., you're looking at AT&T, T-Mobile, Metro PCS, uh, Cricket Wireless, so all the GSM carriers. Um, not carriers like Verizon, which are CDMA-based, but um, the general, the vast majority of people in Canada and the U.S. and the world actually use GSM-based carriers, so Frank will work on any of those. Um, in Canada, you're looking at um, Rogers, Bell, Telus, Kudo, Fido, every carrier and it all works fully LTE compatible and everything. So uh, it doesn't matter what plan you're on. It doesn't matter whether you have data, no data, it'll work with everything. You just put your SIM card in it and you're ready to go. Is it only available in the US and Canada or are you guys looking to go sort of more into international market? Uh, as of right now, we're doing just North America just because uh, kind of staying at home with doing our roots and we'd have to create different models and variations for international uh, phones and whatnot. So for now, it'll just be North America. Um, but we're looking to expand that later on for sure. Awesome. Awesome. And so the phone's not available just now, but it will be as of the launch date, which is September 5th, hopefully when this podcast is going live. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Exactly. So if, it's, if you're hearing this and it's, you know, September 5th or past, you know, go onto our, our, our crowdfunding page and, you know, donate. Whether it's, you know, whether you want to purchase a phone, purchase two phones, or even just give us uh, enter our lottery, our five dollar lottery to win the phone. Anything, yeah. anything goes a long way. 
So tell us a little bit more about the phone. We've got a lot of uh, technical listeners. Um, they're probably wanting to know all the different specs. Okay. Yeah. Um, so actually, a phone like this a year ago, two years ago, would be considered like a flagship level, like extremely high-end phone. So some of the specs, it has a full HD screen. And it's got an eight-core processor. It's got a 3,000 milliamp battery, a full aluminum build, a fingerprint sensor, it's got a 16 megapixel rear camera, 8 megapixel front facing camera. So it's got the whole uh, shebang <laughs> in terms of what you need into in a phone. Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to be looking to, you're not going to be complaining that it's too slow or it's lacking any features that you actually use. Yeah. So as a whole, 64 gigabyte yeah. hard drive and 4 gigabyte RAM. Yeah, 4 gigabyte RAM. Yeah, uh, so, yeah and that, I mean, even most phones that are at a thousand dollar level price points right now don't even give you 64 gigabytes of storage, right? No, so, definitely uh, not. Yeah iPhone still with their 16 and 32. <laughs> yeah, no, I was looking at my phone yesterday. I, th- I think I've got 64, but that that's like always sort of the argument between Apple and the Android Apple device is that uh, you always run out of memory and end up having to delete all your apps and your photos. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so, so is Frank going to be treated uh, a similar way to that or is it going to sort of be more like the Android way where you can add in more memory if you like? You can add, there's a micro SD card slot, so you can, if you need more memory than that, you can 100% add more memory, um, so you never have to delete your apps or your photos ever, <laughs> but yeah, you, you can 100% add extra memory if you'd like. If, if you had to compare it to Apple or an iPhone, for example, or even Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy, what are the biggest differences or, I guess, um, advantages of Frank? It doesn't cost $1,000. I'd like to <laughs> That's a plus. That is, uh, it's a massive plus. <laughs> you know, and it, and it does everything else any phone does. It calls, it tweets, Snapchat, Instagram. You can call your mom. You can call your your sister. You can you can order food from it. You know, you yeah. can use it to pay. You can all all the different it, features are it's, there. Right? It's honestly, and this isn't our tagline, but it's 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 a phone. It, it does phone things. It's not going to like it's not going to end world hunger or anything. But it, it does everything you want in a phone, and it's going to do them. Well, and and as we, I mean, we always say, it, you know, your top sh- your top iPhone, your top <laughs> Samsung will, will likely make Google searches a millisecond faster. So if you're really into that, you know, you want your Google searches <laughs> one millisecond faster, go ahead and spend the extra seven hundred dollars. You know, but uh, that's uh, that's the reality. And I, and I think you know, not not just that. I think we're hoping that people do more than just buy into the the phone, but buy into the idea. Uh, of of we need little we need more comp, little guys in North America starting up these companies and disturbing uh, you know uh, disrupting the market so that these big guys start lowering their phones. I think there's a there's a there's a YouTuber that put it really well. Good phones need to get cheap and cheap phones need to get good. Yeah. And that's that's where we're trying to hit. Yeah, and you, you can see this in Asian markets 100 percent, and you can see it, it's already a shift's happening there. But North America has been very very secluded from that expansion and we'd like to be the the catalyst for that <laughs> yeah for sure have you guys so when you're saying like in asian markets and things are there any i guess primary competitors to frank well there there are there are a lot of companies who are trying to do some something similar to what we're doing but not no one has touched the north american market at all um and even the ones in asia even even if you compare frank to a lot of the phones in asia it is on the same level, if not better than what's being currently offered, mm-hmm. at the same price. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there there are a few. There's a few North American phones like Huawei and and Alcatel and Huawei, and, uh, Ho- Huawei, sorry, <laughs> Alcatel and, and Nokia that that have demonstrated, you know, you know, so, similar phone types, um, a bit of a higher price point than than, the, than us, um, less specs than us. So they're they're kind of they're trying to reduce their oh their prices, but they don't want to also at the same time make their flagship phones look bad, right? Because mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. they're offering the same phone for like $200, yeah. it's not good. <laughs> they, you know, when you're, you're that size of a company, you need to keep your margins at a certain level. We're flexible. And that's what we keep telling people is that we're here to undercut the market. And we're doing that by cutting our margins too, right? We're doing that by going straight to the manufacturers, removing the middleman and selling straight to the consumer. And it's a harder model, you know, at times for, for, for a small business. <laughs> But it gets the product, right? It gets them uh, the phones that they're looking for. And that's why we keep saying that we're customer first. Um, we, throughout the process of our pre-launch, 
um, have changed certain parts of the phone from the feedback that we got from customers. You know, we upgraded the Android system, we've upgraded the camera, Cameras, yeah. and so we're constantly getting feedback. And we've even started looking at new phone models that integrate some of the stuff that that phones have, that customers have been telling us they want to see. And so, when these um, when these phones are shipped, I guess, are you guys? I mean, the sort of the packaging. I, I'm, I have a design background, so I'm all about the packaging and the marketing and stuff like that. So, are there inclusions? Um, for example, are you, so charges, what else do we usually get? Cases, things like that. Are you guys throwing in that sort of stuff or is it very basic? Yeah, it'll come with, uh, the, it'll come with everything that you'd normally expect inside a, uh, a phone to come with and, and then some. Uh, so we're including headphones, cases. It'll come with a screen protector on it as well, charging brick, the power cord. Am I missing anything? And probably a little card telling you about how awesome you are. Oh, you yeah. That's, you got you to gotta have that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, you know, that experience is important to us as it is important to most uh, uh, most phone designers these days, you know, that unboxing experience. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we look to, to match that. Awesome. And so do you think potentially in the future and stuff you'll have uh, accessories you can buy, I suppose, like cases or um, tools that complement the phone? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, we're working on that actively to work with third-party manufacturers to get um, cool accessories that people would want. Things like skins, for example, is something that we'd really, really like to do. Uh, I'm working on getting ready for the uh, for our launch. And so I understand you have a design background, Mo? Uh, a little bit, yeah. A little bit. Are you, are you doing most of the branding efforts um, and the stuff, or are you outsourcing? How are you guys using that? I think... Uh, Pretty much all the design stuff is done by me, yeah. yeah. So, oh, fantastic. Well, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can and speak for it. I've looked at your press kit. It's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. And our videos and stuff, we're working with a creative agency called Creative Vision here in Ottawa. Um, they're the ones, actually, they worked uh, on the Dollar Shave Club campaign. And so they've been uh, putting a bit of their their work with us. And so, you know, Mo's been taking care of design. They've been helping us with the video and, and, and kind of concept, which has been really exciting, so... We're, uh, we already have a few videos up if you want to you know, check them out. They're, they're funny little 30-second videos that kind of make fun of different aspects of phones. Um, and then we'll have our main Kickstarter video up and rolling on September 5th. Yeah. And is the team consisted of you two or is there, have you got like a wider team? So there's four people on our team currently, um, us two, uh, and we have a uh, hardware engineer who is also a quality assurance engineer that uh, works with BlackBerry for seven years actually. Um, so he's, uh, he's on the team. He's taking care of a lot of the hardware optimization uh, for our phone. Um, and then we have uh, Sarah, who's our uh, lead marketer and lead uh, uh, content creator that's been doing a lot of writing for us and communications and all that. And then obviously, uh, Creative Vision is our partner um, that we work with in terms of additional market stuff. So it's, it's us four as the main core. And uh, we outsource some stuff in terms of development. And we're we're probably growing and, and looking at actually adding some software developers to the to the core team. And is this taking up a lot of your? Would you say it's a full time job or is it sort of a side project? Like how would you how would you treat it at the moment? It pretty much is. I mean, to launch a, a crowdfunding campaign that's successful, uh, I think there's a lot more work than the average person would, might would know. Yeah. And we, we we joke about it because when Mo first approached me about a year and a half ago, he said. Oh yeah, next month, like I want to launch my crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, that that did. And I remember, you know, I remember saying, "Next month? Are you sure?" Um, a year and a half later, you know, we uh, we're now, here now, and now we're launching. Good. You know, and and even then, you always wish you had an extra couple days. Right? Yeah. You know, there's there's always some things up, right? And yeah. and that's just the reality. And we know that we know we're gonna launch, and it's not gonna be a hundred percent perfect. But as we launch, we we learn, we grow, and and we we make adjustments. Um, and we hope that uh, more and more people can support us. And hopefully everyone that's, you know, listening to this podcast either <laughs> donates or gives us a share. You know what I mean? Like an extra share on Facebook goes a long way. An extra tweet goes a long way. Um, the more people we can reach, uh, the better. Oh, definitely. And uh, all those things will be in our show notes as well for listeners to link and find. Uh, I guess I'll just end it with the last question. You're both young entrepreneurs, 17 and 24, am I correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So have you found this to be uh, challenging? Like has it, has it sort of been an advantage to be young or, or do you think it's been in some ways a disadvantage if you had to sort of hustle a little bit harder? Like what's your experience been? No, you can go. Yeah, I, I'd, say, I'd say there, there are two advantages and one disadvantage. 
I'll start off with the disadvantage. The disadvantage is credibility and trust, right? When you go to someone and say, we're creating a smartphone, they kind of give us this look, right? Like you're, you <laughs> yeah, know, you're okay. young, what are you doing? What it, like, go get a job. Uh, <laughs> no, or, or, or okay, that's, that's cute. You know, like a, a little bit of like, you know, good luck. That's the disadvantage that we kind of have to constantly prove ourselves, but that's part of the beauty in it too, right? The advantage is that because we're young, we get a lot more people offering, for, offering to help. But a lot more people saying, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. Let me help you. Right. You get this, you know, you guys are young. Let's help. Let me help you out. Let me let's 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 make this happen. And then the second advantage is that because we're young, we can make all the mistakes, yeah. <laughs> you know, because we're young, you know, it, our risk propensity is higher. Our willingness to take risk, our willingness to dive into this, our willingness to, you know, use some of use our savings money to, to make this happen. Right. Yeah. I don't have a family or a house to take care. Of. You know, I, this is this is my baby. Right. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> To, to really give it a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, you feel like you've got a little bit more time to time up your sleeve, I guess. You've got time to fail and recover if you have to. Yeah, he's, but, got, he's got a few extra years on me. But. Yeah, the lack of experience is not. That's, that's, that's not helping. But uh, it's, you make up with it with, uh, with just trying to learn as many new skills as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, you guys are doing a great job. So where, where can our listeners find you? What's your uh, Twitter handle, Instagram handles, things like that? All of our, our social media is just something at Frank is a phone. Uh, Twitter.com slash Frank is a phone, Facebook slash Frank is a phone. So if you want to look us up, Frank is a phone. And I think that's pretty easy to remember. You can Google uh, it, whatever it is. Frank is a phone.com. Yeah. Just remember, Frank <laughs> is a phone. Frank but, is a phone. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate your time today, guys. So we've got Fahd and Mo, who are the uh, co-founders of Frank Technologies. There'll be all the notes in... Uh, on our website, uh, as the boys mentioned. Uh, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Appreciate thanks for having us. Have a good one. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joe Pinto. I'm the business operations manager here at Manage Flitter. Did you know that Twitter can be a powerful social selling platform? But the first step to effective social selling on Twitter is to grow your Twitter account with high quality niche followers. For example, Let's say you are an online bicycle retailer. Manage Flitter could help you grow your Twitter account by helping you find and follow people who have the word cyclist in their bio. The more targeted your search is, the higher likelihood these Twitter accounts will follow you back. We have millions of users, literally, that have used Manage Flitter's search, sort and filtering tools to grow their account with the right followers. This has provided them with a solid base to kickstart their social selling. Feel free to drop by manageflitter.com to trial our product or email us at contact at manageflitter.com to schedule an obligation-free walkthrough. Kate, that interview got a whole lot better when I heard towards the end of the interview that they were only 17 and 24. Wow. (laughs) Mind blown. Good luck to them. Smart, ambitious guys and I, I wish them absolutely all the all the success and isn't it exciting times where uh, ambitious people of that age they, they all these tools like crowdfunding like virtual teams um, like sort of online marketing to actually build a business at a real business at that age is just so fantastic fantastic it's just it's really um it's a real feel-good story for me to hear that they've got a pathway for them to express their entrepreneurialism and their uh, sort of intelligence definitely like they're um they've got a quite a challenge in front of them taking on the big guys but i think i think they have a point i mean they've done their research and they obviously know there's a market for a middle class phone and even just just chatting to them and reading up on their press kit and stuff like it sounds like a great phone like i would test it out what I like most about that phone is it's got dual SIMs, right? If you travel a lot, dual SIM can be so useful because even like when I travel to the States and I change my SIM, I, I need to check my text messages on my old SIM, my Australian SIM every now and then just in case there's something, even though most people know I'm away. And it's just such a pain. So the dual SIM feature is fantastic. I do have to say, though, and I'd, you know, I don't want to knock them giving it a go because I think it's fantastic and I think competition is good for everyone. But you know, manufacturing these devices is seriously hard to get that quality 
up. You know, I think it's it's these companies make it look easy. You know, I mean, and even if you have a look with Samsung and that's the notes and the issues that with the notes and the exploding and f- phones, you know, it was just indicative. It's really hard to get the quality right and to get the reliability right, the safety right, all those things. I would have been interested to find out a little bit more about their manufacturing process. Um, who's actually manufacturing? You know, they've obviously some specialist factory, I would assume, in China. But to, and our phones need to go through a lot, you know, and, um, you, you know, in the early days of smartphones, they would break easy and shatter and, and, and batteries would come loose. And now they've, they've learned how to rigor, uh, you know, make them more sort of robust. And so that's, I'd be interested to see the quality because if they don't get that right, if after sort of six weeks, people are having funny issues and, you know, screens are fading and, and and they'll drop it once and it's it's gone that's going to be a problem so i see that as a as one of their challenges but they definitely know their stuff and um they definitely know what they're doing and um uh, they were definitely right when saying that one of the biggest advantages of being a young entrepreneur is that you have nothing to lose and boy it just gets harder as life goes by and he's so right that if you have the bug you want to give it a go do one of two things in my opinion Go and start up your own business or hit yourself onto another business that's still small enough where you feel like you're having, you know, the, the startup journey and you can impact. And sometimes that's also a very underestimated uh, route because you can get a lot of the benefits without the stress of managing, you know, the fundraising and the money and all of that. But you can sort of get the benefit of making a significant contribution as well. Definitely. And like they made a good point too as well that it's, um, when they consider like their timing, you know, they underestimated how long these things take to do and now like a year and a half later they're looking at launching the product. But yeah, like the, the, the journey for a, um, a crowdfunding campaign like that, like it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a full-time job and like good on them, I say. Like, and I think too as well, like as you are saying about the manufacturing issues, they do have um, – they do have, which is smart, a um, like a return type policy and a warranty. Mm-hmm. So, I think I think you would need to have something like that to back it up. But also, like this isn't the first prototype. Like they have made others and tested it amongst friends mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And um, I think most of it as well, they, they updated it, they changed the camera, they changed some of the resolution and stuff like that just to meet that cu- customer need. Yeah, look, I mean, they, they you know they said they've got uh, an engineer that's X. Blackberry. Blackberry. Yep. Yeah. Blackberry. Which uh, Blackberry is a famous Canadian company, actually. Don't know if you knew that. No, I didn't. Uh, Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense because yeah. they're Canadian. And and of course, in the heyday, Blackberry, especially in the professional uh, world of lawyers and investment bankers, and Blackberry was it. Even before smartphone, they were dedicated Blackberry devices. And again, it, it's testament to the challenge of the industry where, the, where they just got nailed eventually by the smartphones. But yeah, BlackBerry was a famous Canadian company that did incredibly well for many, many years. Obviously, some very smart people behind that. Um, but yeah, I tried to look. It wouldn't let me access the crowdfunding page from, from Australia. It just said it's not available in your area. How much money have they raised, Kate, for this phone? I am not entirely sure. I couldn't find it either. Um, but uh, they were saying it's launching September 5th. So it, it could just be that it's not up yet. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so when, when this podcast see. goes live, it should be available for them to look at. Now, the cheapest Android phone at the moment, like in Australia, isn't it around what? Is it around what? $300 or so? <laughs> I'm an Apple user. I don't know these things. <laughs> I think. <laughs> what's the cheapest Apple phone? $600? Uh, I mean, it would depend if you, if you went back a few, um, like to maybe a four or five, you might get it for five, $600. I mean, yesterday, that's that's a second hand one though, right? Yeah, most likely. I mean, I looked yesterday for, uh, the lowest spec, uh, seven, I think it was iPhone seven. So that's the, the latest phone. So, and that was about probably closer to $800 for the lowest Mm. spec one. My HTC is about a thousand dollars. Yeah. So 
Yeah, I think Netflix. for if you want a decent phone, you, you're definitely looking at a thousand or more dollars these days. It's um, yeah. Look, I think def- I see a lot of my friends posting on Facebook. Uh, my phone's died again. Does anyone have a spare iPhone or Android that they're not using? And and that might be their type of market. You know, where people um, just really can't justify or can't afford that thousand dollar mark. Um, so yeah, look, I think if they get their quality right, I think um, could definitely be interesting. I don't know how it works so much in the US with plans. I know in Australia, a lot of people prefer not to pay for their phones and just go on plans for 18 months or for two years. And then they effectively get the phone for free. It does depend though. A lot of the contracts I've like looked into in the past and stuff, they you pay a certain amount for the phone and then a certain month for the plan every month. So you, right. at the end of the day, you actually end up paying more because there is like a lot of a lot of phone plans that are super cheap. Like they might not be the number one carrier, but they are really cheap. And if you can afford to buy the phone outright and then get on a cheap plan, in the long run, you're actually better off. Yeah, look, I, I've always liked to buy the phone outright. I just think it is, you've got more control and yeah, there's n- none of these hidden fees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I see Vodafone in Australia is now having plans that they don't lock you into. Oh, that's and good. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's about time that happens. You know, competition is is strong, and um, there's another another company at home, and they do. Um, it might be Telstra. I'm not too sure, but they do new phone feeling. So you you get locked into a certain plan, but every year or two years or something like that, they give you the latest version of that phone. So probably the latest. If you get a Samsung, you'll get the latest Samsung. If you're on iPhone, you get the latest iPhone. So they just keep giving you new phones all the time, but you have to stick on the original plan. Yeah, I think that's Telstra. I think I think I was offered that, but I politely declined. I don't, <laughs> I don't like to be, you know, I don't like to be locked in. Anyway, that's uh, it's a monkey podcast for this week, episode number one hundred and four, done and dusted. You can always email us at podcast at it's a monkey dot com, and uh, thank you to those of you. We always try to get back to. The emails. If 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 we don't, don't feel bad to ping us again. My inbox is just not a pretty place. As much as I try to use the filters and tools and all sorts of things, just things just slip through frustratingly. You can also tweet us and follow us um, on Facebook. Next week we got a great interview with Dr. Tal Rapke. Uh, we talk a lot about blockchain and Bitcoin on this podcast. And I've actually found someone who's developing a really interesting application on the blockchain, a medical application to to make uh, prescriptions go paperless. Um, he's a super smart guy and it's a, a startup based in Sydney, Australia. So I managed to drag him into the studio. So we'll be um, chatting about that next week. Of course, you can go to itsamonkey.com, listen to all previous episodes, including episode 100 with Kevin Kelly, which was fantastic. I think it was 101 with Melanie Swan, where we spoke about the blockchain, which was absolutely fantastic. So lots of interesting interviews there and we'll catch you next week. Um, so, uh, Yeah, thanks for joining uh, myself and Kate on this week's podcast. See you later.